Coming up next on Signal by Sony, it's time to get serious about shooting video on your DSLR. We're going to unbox Sony's new portable monitor and put it to work. Plus, we'll turn up the volume on some of the sweetest rides on the big screen and talk to the guy who designs every detail. Signal by Sony starts right now. Hey everyone, I'm Anthony. And I'm Samia. We've got another fine edition of Signal for you, starting with the camera accessory that's practically a must-have if you're a pro-level photographer or if you do any kind of filmmaking. Yes, I'm talking about an external on-camera field monitor. Right, so field monitors are nothing new in the world of broadcasting and filmmaking. Professional shooters have been using them for a very long time, and they can be very big and very expensive, uh -huh. like thousands of dollars. What is new is the range of smaller, more affordable on-camera monitors that have been coming out within the last year. And these are geared more towards DSLR filmmakers with smaller budgets. Uh, Marshall and Small HD are two of the most recognizable monitor brands. Well, Anthony, Sony actually recently released its own 5-inch clip-on portable monitor, and filmmakers of all levels have already been using it and posting the results on YouTube. Now, what's nice about Sony's portable monitor is that it's compatible with almost any brand of DSLR camera or HD video camera with an HDMI output not just Sony cameras. Right, and we actually have one here in the studio to unbox for you. Here it is. This you is really cool. Mind. Yeah, so first of all, safety first, warranty, manual. Instructions in case you don't know what to do. Read it all thoroughly, guys, thoroughly. There will be a quiz. So the monitor comes in this nice little drawstring bag to keep it protected. Very nice, this is the monitor itself, very cool. This is... The sunshade. What's this for? So this is if you're out uh, under bright lights or in direct sun, this clips on and then... Whoa! Yeah, I like that. So you don't see any of like the sun glare when you're trying to watch? This feels serious movie. every time I do this. <laughs> like you're a superhero. Yeah, totally. Uh, it's got two hot shoe adapters, one for standard hot shoes and one for quick release hot shoe. So mm -hmm. you're covered no matter what kind of camera you've got. That's really nice. And then finally, you have got the mini, it's a full HDMI cable. So it goes from your camera right into the monitor. Very cool. Very nice. Now the Sony portable monitor uses the same Infolithium M series battery that a lot of Sony Alpha cameras use. We actually have one right here, as you can see. Now one thing to keep in mind is that it doesn't come with a monitor, so you do have to buy it separately. Now if you shop around for similar size field monitors, you'll find that some of them come with batteries and some of them don't, so make sure you look into that. Well thanks to our great Sony connections, we got two portable monitors. We just took one of them out of the box, but we got another one a couple weeks ago to actually play around with. You actually went to go use it, right? Yeah, I went to a, I went to a music festival in New York and I had it actually attached to my NEX3. Mm. Uh, I used like a flash bracket and I was carrying it around with me and it's awesome. Were people stopping in... you like, whoa, yeah, like, what's what is that? that camera? What are you using? Yeah, it was really cool. Uh, came in really handy. The pop-up shade was great because, you know, there was a lot of stage lighting and stuff mm -hmm. like that, so that kept the glare off the monitor for me. Um, it makes it so much easier to pull focus because you've got this tiny little viewfinder screen, yeah. right? And so when you're, when you're focusing manually, everything on that tiny screen looks like it's in focus because it's making everything look sharper. So it's nice to have the bigger monitor be like, oh, okay, this got is it. actually in focus. So I used it on the NEX3, but because the portable monitor is designed with the DSLR shooter in mind, we wanted to see how well it works on a few different brands. Uh, first, I took it on a test shoot with the Sony Alpha A33. How's that? It was really, really cool. It really complements the camera very, very well. It's got like a swivel to it, so when I need to get like an up high shot, I can just pull it down or turn it up. It was really great. Really great, and it uh, shows the video full frame too. Okay. So you can like check all your all your safe zones and all that. It was really really cool. Uh, we also gave it to a professional photographer who used it with a Canon T2i and also with a Panasonic GH2. So now you can really get a sense of how nice it is to have a bigger screen when you're out there shooting. You know, like I said, the sunshade is super convenient in bright sunlight. It also protects the LCD screen from damage. I am constantly knocking my camera stuff around. I'm really klutzy, so I like having everything protected. Uh, the monitor has that. 90 degree pivot up and down so it's really useful for high angle or low angle shots it also swivels around 360 degrees this is really cool i really do want to show this off swivel yeah super super handy 
Uh, it's also got a menu with a control wheel, so you can change things like screen brightness, contrast, color temperature. Uh, you can do safe zones if you're shooting video, so you know when things are action safe, title safe, you know? Uh, the most useful thing is probably the color peaking and the pixel magnification. So basically what that does is, uh, with color peaking, the entire image on the monitor goes mm -hmm. black and white, and then anything that's in focus is outlined in pink. Okay. So you can automatically tell whether you have sharp focus on something. Basically you're saying if you're a serious videographer at all, if you're gonna mm. make any legit videos, you need one of these. I mean, it, it does, it really does come in handy. It's really gonna save you a lot of time and a lot of kind of like... Post-production? Yes. Not fun. <laughs> yes. Uh, also comes with its own speaker and a headphone jack so you can listen to your audio from the monitor, so that's cool okay. too. Uh, a few things to note, the monitor safe zone and guides that I'm talking about mm -hmm. uh, and the focus peaking that I'm talking about work better on some cameras than others. Uh, cameras that output full frame video, for okay. instance. You know, some, some things, this monitor is just like hooking your camera up to a TV, right? Okay. So anything you see on your camera screen, you're gonna see on this monitor. So if your camera puts up like menu stuff on the side, that's gonna show up on this monitor. Okay. So all of a sudden then your little, your safe zone guides don't really work. Yeah. But it's still great for like getting focus and everything. Mm -hmm. You just kind of lose that one function. But if you have a, like the A33 exports full frame, mm -hmm. so practically full frame. So you can use the safe zones there. Uh, I think the T2i did as well. I would have to double check on that. But anyway, uh, comes with the quick release hot shoe and the standard hot shoe only. Uh, if you have a camera with an intelligent accessory shoe, like a lot of the handy cams yeah. have those, you'll need to order an external bracket to attach the monitor to it because it. it doesn't come with something to hook that up. But at but, least it comes with two of them. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's really great. It's really amazing for the price, uh, but you just want to keep those couple things in mind. All right, guys, so there you have it, a complete rundown of the Sony portable monitor. Now, as always, we encourage you to do as much research as possible. Now, we found a lot of video reviews on YouTube, so that's a good place to check it out. And if you decide the Sony portable monitor is right for you, it's available now for about $400. You can also get the bundle, which includes the monitor, a battery, and a battery charger for about $100 more. All the details are on the Sony website. All right, Anthony, it's time to talk cars. I am actually not a big car guy. Really? I love my car. I like yeah. living it. Yeah, no, the problem for me with most cars is that they do not have booster rockets or machine guns, so. It's yeah, an Anthony, you're talking about the Batmobile, and um, you can't have the Batmobile because A, you're not a superhero, and B, they're not real. Uh, you don't know that I'm not a superhero. And number two, they are too. <laughs> Somebody's got to build all those cars for movies and TV, and that someone is Fireball Tim. He is one of the biggest names in Hollywood. Fireball Tim is the go-to guy for Hollywood vehicles, and you would be surprised at the number of movies he's actually designed vehicles for. Movies like Batman, Captain America, Gone in 60 Seconds, Speed, Starship Troopers, which is the greatest movie of all time. Way too many for me to name. Well, you actually seem to know a lot about cars for someone who says he isn't a big car guy. Well, I am a big movie guy, and I'm a big comic book guy, and you know who else is? Ron Richards, the co-founder of iFanboy.com. And Ron is a lucky man, because we just sent him down to Fireball Tim's Hollywood car lot so he can give us a closer look at some of the most famous cars on the silver screen, inside and out. You know, rocket launchers are nice, but I'm kind of more interested in the car stereo system. You think superheroes care about their car stereos? Yeah, you need motivational beats to go fight bad guys, right? No? All right. That's valid. Well, uh, let's go watch and uh, find out. Hey, I'm Ron Richards from my fanboy, and I'm here on a special assignment for Signal by Sony. Super excited. We're here at a secret location in Hollywood, one of the best secret locations in Hollywood, the home of Fireball Tim. If you've seen movies and comic book movies and science fiction movies like I have, you've probably seen his work. He's done the cars for all the movies that we love, and guess what? They're all back here, so we're gonna go check it out. Hey, Fireball, thanks for having us over to your amazing place of work. My pleasure, Ron. This is a really cool place to come to every day. It, it is. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. How did you get into modifying cars and, and and this kind of business as a, in, in the beginning? Well, I, I, uh, I grew up in a Hollywood family. My parents were writer-producers, and uh, uh, they were always doing a variety of different projects, so a lot of them had to do with vehicles. And then one day, my, uh, my dad, back in the late 70s, or early 80s, somewhere around there, uh, brought me out to Cinema Vehicle Services, where we are. And I just saw how incredible, you know, uh, that cars are a character in films as much as the actors are. And uh, it just took off from there. So when you get a project and they come to you with a, we've got a movie and we need this kind of car, what kind of research do you do to build that character of the car? Do you read the script? Do you try to understand the driver of it? Uh, the, the answer would be yes to all of that. Yeah. Is that uh, the more diverse you can be with, with building the character of the car, 
the better it is. Uh, it, we even make suggestions to certain things because sometimes we'll build stunt vehicles, sometimes uh, uh, there'll be a hero car. Every car is, uh, has a different application. And take me through the process of modding a car. Like, do you start out on the drawing board and sketch out the visuals of it, the paint job, all the way down to the type of engine, to the type of radio, that sort of thing? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So we'll, we'll literally start from the concept page, and that could be a simple sketch. Yeah. Uh, it could be renderings we get from the studio. It could be an idea that the director comes and, and wants to talk about, and I'll develop renderings for that. Uh, it can be from the, the broadest sense as to the different versions of the car as the overall picture down to the, the tiny details, everything from what type of motor it would have to what type of stereo system it would have. Very cool. Yeah, and that's one thing I think that I found fascinating is that a lot of people watch movies and they see cars and we've seen the behind the scene documentaries and people think it's just a shell and it doesn't actually run. But these cars work. I mean, they've got oh, yeah. engines and they've got car, like car stereos and electronics. Um, why, why go through all that level of detail to make the car work when it's movie magic? Well, it, it, you have to look at the fact that the cars are actors and sometimes They'll, they'll pull a stunt like an actor would. Sometimes they'll show up late, sometimes they, sometimes they won't start properly, sometimes they'll be temperamental. For each individual scene, there's a, there's a, a focus, a goal that the director wants to achieve. Uh, it may be the interior of the car, or the exterior, maybe a stunt, it may be simple uh, closing of the door. You know, all those intricate little things is part of the story to be able to convey. Well, you've got a ton of great cars here. I think you're gonna show me some of them. Oh so yeah, I'd you bet. To check them all out. All right, let's awesome. go. So we're in a uh, very unusual car. <laughs> this, is, this is the four hill drive from the movie <laughs> The Flintstones. Excellent. Uh, it is built on a, on a, uh, a Dodge Ram chassis. Okay. Uh, it is actually electric. So, uh, so it does have an engine. I don't need to use my feet to, to propel it. You can try, but I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it. It wouldn't, wouldn't go too far. All the cars in here must be worth so much money. How, what, do you have an uh, intense security system that protects them? Or? Funny you should ask. Yeah? We got our buddy right here. Oh, Jesus, from, look at uh, that. <laughs> Terminator 3. So uh, he's our sentry. You know, he may look like he's sleeping right now, but uh, yeah. just don't move too, too fast. <laughs> Otherwise, these things will kick into gear. So now this is actually fully functioning. It moves, rolls, the whole kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. This, is, this is the actual piece that was used in Terminator 3. It's just kind of a neat thing. It's, it's a vehicular contraption. It's not necessarily a car, but it does yeah. move on its own. So this is a more recent um, movie car uh, from the Sources Apprentice in the cage, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we took this to a car show last weekend, and I asked uh, some guys there who were collecting Rolls Royces. I said, if you can guess what year this is, I'll give you the car. <laughs> yeah. And uh, most of them said 1935, 36, and where they were surprised to hear was in 2010, <laughs> exactly. which is what it is. It's built on a Chevy truck chassis. Yep. It is an exact duplicate of Nicolas Cage's car that he owns that oh, they really? use for the film, which is a million dollar Rolls. Uh, this was built for about a half a million dollars, but it's a stunt vehicle. Now, this is one I'm super excited about because this is going to be in the upcoming Captain America movie. Yeah, several of these were used for Captain America. They're regular, you know, old classics, but you'll see that although this has some vinyl on it, um, those cars back then, they didn't have vinyl, so sure, all this yeah. stuff is painted. And, and this one is styled, you know, it's a US, US Army military car kind of limo right. kind of thing. Right, absolutely. Um, so when you do, when you get like a retro movie like Captain America take place in the 40s, mm -hmm. uh, are you looking for original parts or are you just making it look the part? Once again, the answer would be yes. It depends yeah. on the vehicle. So yeah. sometimes, you know, we'll find vehicles that don't quite uh, aren't the right colors, we have to modify them. Uh, it depends on the scene. You know, uh, this had, you know, tinted windows. Sure. You know, they didn't really have tint back then. All right, so I heard a rumor that you've got a car that's near and dear to my childhood, the uh, the General Lee from the Dukes of Hazzard. Where'd, where'd you hear that? I just, I found a lot. There was, I, I heard whispers that there's the General I'm, Lee's. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right here. Oh, there's the orange. This is the original car from the TV series, one of the wow. last remaining cars. You'll see that the paint is really bad because basically all they had was uh, some spray cans and uh, and not much budget. But it sounds great. We don't drive it that much. Take it to shows, things like that. Get some air. But it's worth a lot. Does the horn make the noise as well? Uh, the, it's not hooked up on this one. But do you want to have a seat? Come on over. Oh wow! There you go. Now this is what I'm looking, talking about. This is the car. Absolutely. So this is Eleanor. So give me the full specs. This uh, is a... This is a, uh, the number two hero car. Okay. So there was a number of cars that were done as stunts, but this was a, uh, the primary vehicle that Nicolas Cage drove in the film. Uh, you can tell because it has the, the nitrous bottle, the stuff that's actually hooked up. He's a very good driver. Uh, he did a, a tremendous amount of the driving stunts himself. So this is a 67 Shelby? 67. Yeah. It has uh, some modification, as you can see. Yeah. So wh when when this movie came out, like, did you know like this car is going to be the star? Like, This is going to be the one everyone's to talk about? Or? Well, we hoped. Uh, I mean, you really can't lose with a car like this, right. you know, and, uh, and Nicolas Cage is a, an A-list uh, actor, so he's, you know, he's really going to bring it home well. Yeah, and that movie came out 12, 13 years ago, yeah, and the car, the car lives on much more than the movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, everybody knows her. So you're going to let me borrow it for the day. I can drive it around, right? That would be no. <laughs> nice try, though. you got to be kidding me.
So another car I'm a big fan of is the, the Mini. I love those little cars, and I hear you got a stocked one. Uh, stocked, absolutely. Yeah. The, behind us is a, yeah. a 650 horsepower Mini Cooper police car. Uh, we built it over 13 weeks on the uh, the Speed Channel show, Street Tuner Challenge. It's chock full of Sony gear, which is really cool. It has it actually has two systems. Oh, wow. So it has the upfront system uh, and full speakers and subs and everything, but it also has a standalone. Uh, 40 mile an hour, what we call the Sound Rover, which is a an RC car that doubles as a Sony system. So the concern was that the motor was so loud, we weren't sure we could hear the music. It's actually the other way around. The, oh, wow. the music is so great, you don't even hear the motor. And it can do donuts <laughs> and all kinds of cool stuff. So I'm back here in the Captain America car because I just can't get enough. This has been such an awesome day here at the Hollywood Garage with Fireball. Awesome guy, awesome cars. I can't believe we saw so many cool cars from all the great movies that we love. Eleanor from Gone 60 Seconds was the clear highlight car for me. That was so, so cool. So thank you, Fireball, for giving me the opportunity to check that out. And thanks to Anthony and Samia. They had a great time. Thanks for sending me down to Hollywood. And back to you guys. All right, we want to thank Ron for that report. That must have been a lot of fun. I am kind of jealous, I'm actually. I'm so jealous. Anyway, that's it for Signal for now. But if you want to watch more of our show, just go to Sony.com slash Signal. There you'll find links to all of the products we featured on this episode. Or you can go to YouTube.com slash Signal to post your comments and questions. We do read them, you know, so uh, please be nice. <laughs> right? Sure. No? Or be mean. Or be mean. Be mean Give it to me real. Be, be mean to Anthony. <laughs> Alright guys, for now, this is Sami and Anthony saying see you next time. See you guys later. Don't know where we're going. The car is everywhere. <laughs> okay, now I'm gonna puke.